Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Sebastian Curry, the artist in residence, and I'm here at the Institute and delighted to have with me tonight um, these two fantastic performers, uh, violinist Laura St. John and pianist Martin Kennedy. Um, and we wanted to talk about the concert. Um, it's a very interesting assortment of pieces and there's a lot to talk about. And I sort of wanted to start with what con constitutes most of the second half of the concert, which is a project that Lara's been working on for some time, collecting folk tunes from Eastern Europe. And maybe could you tell us a little bit about the whole project? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess basically, when I was a little kid, I ended up in, um, in Hungary for the first time. I guess I was about 11 or 12, and it was uh, still behind the Iron Curtain at that time, and it just, it sort of, everybody kind of just breathed and lived music, um, all kinds of music. Like, you know, people would, would know second movements of Beethoven sonatas that I was playing, and uh, I mean, yeah, amazing things like that, but also their own music, you know, every night at restaurants and stuff. Uh, yeah, I know, I was 11, but um, I was yeah, still out there. Well, and <laughs> and do you, how do you, I thought it was so, you were in Hungary as at the age of 11. In and Budapest, what you yeah, there? doing, uh, I don't know, some concerts with the Budapest, uh, the radio, the Franz Liszt Chamber Orchestra. I mean, I went back two or three times. And um, she I was 11. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. Well, the third <laughs> time I think I was 14 or something. But uh, I, I do remember just kind of having having a violin case there. It was after a concert and just kind of kicking it under the table because these guys were so amazing. You know, I just <laughs> didn't want anyone to know I was a fiddle player also. <laughs> and, um, you know, just all, all this music and, and not only that, but but folk stuff, not only the gypsy stuff, but I, I started listening to, to a lot of that. And then I think uh, through no real mistake, I ended up, um, uh, I graduated from, from Curtis, actually I was uh, 16 and I went to the, the then USSR. So then, you know, there I learned more and more. And then over the years, just traveling all over the place, I've just picked up all of these, um, all of these tunes. And of course, now with iTunes and um, stuff, there's uh, everything's out there. So just it's just been a real kind of hobby for years and years. And um, I probably have tens of thousands of tunes, yeah, actually. Yeah. It's really I haven't true. asked you about that because you've said I've heard, you've said that number many times, and I've wondered, <laughs> like, really? That's an awful lot. Like, yeah. give us a sense of where they're from and why it seems to many, I mean, you haven't been that many places in... Well, just books and books yeah, of yeah. them, like right. uh, actually on, on CD and then stuff. I've, I've tra transferred uh, c all my cassettes to CD, to, to files, to there's... there's <laughs> I don't have a real count, but um, you know those books where you have like four CDs per page? I, I probably have about 30 of those with only Eastern European stuff. And is that something you listen to regularly? I mean, sort of... Well, I kind of know my favorites than, by yeah. now, I guess. So I sort of pull it out and um, every once in a while. And so anyway, what happened with this whole idea was that I suddenly realized about three or four years ago that I know all these composers and I have all these tunes and why shouldn't I just put them together? And I started noticing that composers were more or less staying with their own backgrounds. And so now when I ask somebody, I tend to have it, you know, I tend to say, would you like to do a piece from where you're from? And you know, usually they're, they're game. And uh, yeah, so tonight we have, uh, I guess, four pieces that I've had done for that purpose. And, uh, and one of them is actually by, by Martin. It's a world premiere, or it was last night. And it's um, his new version of Chardash, um, the Hungarian thing. And of course, um, Kennedy isn't exactly a Hungarian name, so it doesn't, it doesn't always uh, go that way. But uh, <laughs> and then also we have um, John Psathas, who's a, uh, a New Zealand-born Greek composer. Did um, do we do it? He, he called it something else from the he called it the pain will find us from the lyrics, and it's actually a Greek gypsy uh, tune. And we have a Macedonian gypsy tune by uh, uh, Milica Paranosic, who's who's here. Who's here? Tonight. <laughs> Which is great. And um, um, oh, and then. Um, a piece called Nagilara, um, which is of course Nagila Hava, uh, done by Matt Herskowitz, in a in a very in a way that you almost can't recognize this ultra famous tune. Yeah, except in moments it comes out. It but, does. Yeah. Um, and and Martin, tell us about from from your point of view of composing this one by which, by the way, as you see, the the concert is framed by um, pieces of his. The first piece, Trivial Pursuit, is also um, by him. But tell us about working on um, this project of. 
Well, this was the second one I'd done. I um, uh, written so Serbian, um, right? Yeah, I'd wrote a Serbian one first, uh, "Song of the Moon," uh, which was it was based on um, this r just the most gorgeous melody you'll ever hear in your life, and it really is an ama amazing melody. So it was a treat to work on that. And then this was Hungarian. I'm neither Serbian nor Hungarian, so it was it was a lot of fun to put my um, you know, to put my little spin on, on on everything. But the 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 uh, Chardash um, was you know everyone's heard this tune so many times and I wanted to try and find some way to uh, bring something new to it and my thought was the Hungarian Rhapsody the uh, second Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt uh, to try and put those two tunes on top of each other at the same time and have reference to it because they actually have very similar chordal structure um, they they fit pr together pretty nicely so I had a fun time a Hungarian quad limit huh? exactly yeah. exactly and I love the I, I guess they call them mashups these days but right. I just love the um, the puzzle of putting things on top of each other and, and seeing if they can they can work together and that was what the, the idea of the Chardash was yeah. what well, one of the things I think that's interesting to ask you about um, and you too um, is because Laura's project has this sort of specific thing she asks the composer to do and you know most of the time left to our own devices we have our own sort of the own thing own things we are working on and thinking about and this sort of draws you out of that and makes you do something a little different maybe engage with a folk music which I don't know how much often you do that um, is that something part of your well you know what uh, you know over, over the past few years especially working with Lara I've done a lot of these arrangements even for the and I'm sure you'll talk about the Polka CD it's um, you know, when you're working with different people's music and doing arranging um, you learn a lot uh, that you don't I don't think you would learn if you just right. stuck to your v your tunnel vision of writing your own music and um, and the benefit of that really is, uh, well, I, it, 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 it makes sense now when you see that Bartok did all this ethnomusicology and wrote down these tunes and why his music is so wonderful because he spent time working with these other things and, and Ravel the same way and uh, be even Beethoven had the uh, Colnudre and things like that that he would, he would work with. So um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, you become better as a composer because you're, you're introduced to uh, uh, other things, uh, other things to work with. Sort of like the, the famous Stravinsky quote about uh, talking about um, restrictions are what gets the fosters the imagination. The more restrictions you put on yourself, and this is quite a restriction. The Chardash. This is what you have to work with, and it's got to be recognizable, and it's got to work. Um, so from that, bears all sorts of fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. You also mentioned the word arrangement, which is interesting, which also relates sort of to these pieces, because like there's this fine line between what's composition and what's simply adaptation or something, right? And you, and you ask the players to what? It, do whatever they wanted or were they supposed to make sure they could hear the tune or could they do whatever they want with it? You, you gave them free reign? Pretty much carte blanche actually for the composers. That's um, always dangerous. Yeah, it, well, <laughs> but you know, I, I know most of these people so I kind of know what I'm getting into. So, so when I ask Matt Herskowitz, who's this incredibly chromatic and awesome jazz pianist, uh, as well as a, a composer, to, to do something with Nagila Hava, I kind of have a pretty good idea how it's going to come out. You know, it's going to be very dense, very chromatic, very, you know, I was just like, okay, you know, you do your own thing. And he always makes up like some sort of ostinato, and I ask for four minutes, and it's always seven or eight, and you know. <laughs> But um, you know, but with with Martin, obviously with the with the Tardash, we just we wanted like an ender for this one, a program ender, and something that everybody would recognize and enjoy and possibly laugh at. It's a great ender, as, as you'll hear. Um. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but otherwise, I mean, I, I w the the idea is not to have a, a, an exact transcription, because I can sure. I can do that myself. You know, uh, the idea is to sort of uh, have different different ideas and, and put them into that and, and sort of, I mean, the I hope that, that the composer comes out through this piece. Right, and so you're saying when you're asking them to, you have in your mind what you know they do and then you have this tune and you sort of have this, you don't know what it's going to come out like, but you have some imagined I combination. I, I yeah. give about, usually about eight to ten tunes right. and then we end up with two and then, and then that's that's what's done. Yeah, that's that's what it's been my mo so far. <laughs> right, and you have more more to come. I take it. Oh yeah, yeah. More in the works, right, at the moment. Uh, next week in Toronto, I'm uh, premiering an Armenian tune, really beautiful, my my favorite of all time, which I heard in Yerevan when I was 17. Oh, nice. um, and then uh, got a couple. I've got a Palestinian one coming. Um, that that this this guy's mother sang for him actually. So I mean, sometimes it's it's really quite heartwarming where they come from. Sounds fantastic. Um, 
and t tell me too, the two of you, um, you've been working together for some time or? Oh yeah, like uh, maybe, yeah, maybe 12 years or something. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. And you've been playing his music. It's a sort of interesting thing too, you're both playing together and then you write and yes, have you been? Yeah, I guess I guess at first I think I think we met because um, I had just Shermer had sort of dropped the ball on giving me uh, John Corleano's Chacon, and I was about to go and do the Chinese premiere in Beijing, and they got me the music like a week before so me, and I was so desperate to go through this with someone who could who could read something like that on the piano. So this is how I met Martin outside of uh, we were at some concert at Alice Tully, uh, where uh, your piano sonata was being played, right by Sohail, yeah. And and I said, I heard you're also a pianist. You're a composer. You must be able to like read like the Dickens. And he's like, Yeah, I'm pretty good. And so anyway, it started out that way, and then we started doing recitals and and, and working together on other projects. And that's great. And what's it like when you're playing a piece of his? Like, does he, you know, does he say, you know, do you can you still say, oh, you know, you're dragging, or does he tell you what to do? And you know, how, how does that how does that di does that dynamic change at all when it's his own music? Should I not be asking this um. question? <laughs> but I'm asking, I want to know what both of you say. <laughs> well, to be nice about it, um, I think we both kind of have input. Right. <laughs> which, which? <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Exactly. Um, no, but I mean, especially for an original one, like we're starting the concert with with Trivial Pursuits. I mean, I'm I'm going to try to do as much as possible what what he intended, and you know, but. I always feel like if a composer just sort of writes a piece and then expects it to be exactly as written, to to an extent, okay. But I mean, what's the what's the performer there for? I mean, that why not put it on a MIDI in that case? So so I I do tend to kind of no, put a stamp. Performers on me. there because MIDI can't do exactly what the composer wants. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, it's it's true. I mean, I don't I don't know if you've <laughs> you find it, Martin, but I find it very much. A first performance, you're very much like that. You really want it to be what yeah. you thought. But after that, it's, it's of course it's fun to let go and let people find um, their own way with it, for sure. Yeah. Well, I know uh, I just had a talk with, um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but uh, with John Corleano. And he's actually, he's opposite for me in recording. Like, I, for me, I'm always looking for the arc. And I do, I have my own label, I do my own editing, all this kind of stuff. And I will leave in, you know, things galore. Just just so that I have like the live feeling and the and I tend to go from beginning to end of, of every movement, like never take little pieces and certainly never edit little pieces. And John said that it's so important to him that exactly what he wrote is there that he said he will just spend hours and hours and hours like just doing the little tiniest little edit. Mm -hmm. And so we, so I mean, each to their own, but it's funny to see that from the composer's perspective as opposed to the performer's because exactly. the performer wants this you know, spring wind happening, and the composer wants every little note. So, right. well, usually. Hopefully wants some balance between the two, I suppose. One yeah. would hope. Yeah. yeah. And and so, let's talk a little bit about the first piece you mentioned, Trivial Pursuit. Um, when, when is that from, and tell us a little bit about, about it. Uh, that was from 2009, and um, I was, I, we'd, I'd never really written anything for Lara, so I didn't, I don't think I told you that I was doing that. I yeah. just, just sort of wrote it. Uh, for fun, I wanted to write a violin piano piece, and it really became about because um, uh, we really, really, really like playing Trivial Pursuit, the board game. Mm -hmm. uh, just play it a lot. And the piece um, doesn't sound like a Trivial Pursuit, however. Oh, there's lots. Of <laughs> there's, there's lots of little Easter eggs in it. Uh, no, ah. it's it's uh, it's uh, well, for one thing, it's, um, it's everyone's played Trivial Pursuit, I'd imagine. Okay, well, we the piece is in six little sections, <laughs> um, six little pies. And some pies are harder for the violin and easier for the piano and vice versa. And I, th and I think, um, for example, geography is very hard for me. And Lara's very good at it because she travels everywhere. So uh, those are every time you see me struggling, that's geography. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when it's history, is it history? I think yeah. it's history is the worst. Yeah, that's the fifth pie, the one where she's struggling all the time. Uh, so there are things like that. But there's also... Um, uh, the uh, again with the Stravinsky idea of um, uh, giving yourself giving yourself limitations. That piece had to. The idea was I wanted to think of something also that was kind of a trivial pursuit, and it was um, came from me uh, came to mind the story I'd read about Mozart, where he um, his kids would uh, torture him by playing a major scale downstairs, but ending on the leading tone. The da 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 da, and, and 
he had to resolve it, so he had to run downstairs and hit the note mm -hmm. just to, to get it resolved. So I wanted to torture the audience in the same way, because um, the, the idea being that that is a trivial pursuit, it's something that just keeps on going. So it's a scale that uh, once it gets to the leading tone, it goes down to the scale um, uh, half step up and half step up, and it it's like so it's like an Escher drawing. It just never really completes itself. And so it had to be in six sections. It had to keep on going in a spiral. Um, and once you start saying it has to do this, it has to do this, it has to do this, things go quicker um, when you're writing. Is that it a general thing? Do you set up similar things in other pieces? Oh, I yes. mean, not, not yeah. that particular one, but some oh, yeah, definitely. project to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, a, a blank sheet is, um, you, you know, it's, it's infuriating to look at, and I have no idea what to do, but if someone says it's in 3 4, it's a Passacaglia, it's for four violins, it's in C major, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know suddenly, suddenly it's, it, things are narrowed down and you can. You have a better sense, so. Sure, no, I totally understand. Um, great, and the, the second piece on the program is a work by Heinzen, um, an Australian composer, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little about him, because most of us don't know him. I, I didn't know him at all until you brought me to his intention. Right, he's, um, he's an Australian composer. I, I recorded his violin concerto back in uh, 07, uh, because I thought it was in an amazing voice, like just he doesn't sound like anyone else, which is really hard to do these days. And in, I think it was 09, when Wolf Trap, uh, Martin and I were doing a recital at Wolf Trap and um, they asked me for a commission, so I asked Mar uh, Matthew if he would if he would write a piece for us. And it was, at the, ag actually it was completely carte blanche. Like I just said, piece, violin, piano, about 10 minutes. That's all. And he based it on Maralinga, which is a province in South Australia. And apparently the most toxic land in the world now because in the 50s, the British and the sort of uh, collusion with the collusion of the Australian government, um, they did a whole bunch of nuclear testing in this area, but they also um, didn't bother to evacuate. So it's kind of, and then everybody sort of swept it under the carpet until about, uh, eight years ago when the BBC actually did a great big expose on it, which Matthew saw and he's actually been there. And so this piece is, is kind of basically about nuclear <laughs> devastation and, um, and, and the injustice of what was done to the native people there. And he actually, he uses, you hear a lot of things in five, like the da 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 da, this kind of thing. And that's actually from the, um, from a, a traditional tune of the, Yat Yara <laughs> tribe okay. uh, from Maralinga. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Um, and what was he? Is he live in Australia now? Or is he in the UK or? No, nope, he's in Australia. He's in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, he's he's probably Australia's sort of most commissioned, best known composer at this point. So uh, I think it just takes the, it, the Pacific is kind of big. That's that's great. And now I think I mean it, in addition to all the pieces from Eastern Europe. And now one of the composers is from New Zealand, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yes. yeah. So we have a very, and one's from Australia, one's from New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. You're from UK originally, or you're originally? But mostly grew up here, yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, Milita's uh, from Belgrade originally, from Serbia. And John from New Zealand is actually Greek origin, so. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Matt Herskowitz, yeah, he's from he's upstate from New York, but he's kind of Canadian now, because he lives in Montreal. And uh, yeah, so it's a it's a whole big gamut of people. Uh -huh. And of course, you're from Canada too. Great I'm yeah. Canadian originally. Yeah, I mean New York City now, but um, yeah, it's just it, it tends to be folks that I've just just sort of met mostly by chance and by luck and by uh, by 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 good luck in uh -huh. my life. So. And, and that's true also of John Coriolano, right? You've you've worked with him for years, right? Or yeah, the piece, the piece I'm playing f of his is the only solo violin piece, um, and it's dedicated to me, although not exactly written for me, but um, it's, um, it's, it's a pretty, a pretty I'll, I'll probably talk about it right beforehand, so I don't want to like repeat oh, myself. Okay. <laughs> but then, I, then, I'll, then I'll tell you one, because we didn't talk about it last night, but um, it's a piece he wrote for um, the Tchaikovsky competition, and, and uh, 
should I not even? T I, I, I'm not going to mention a lot about well, it. But if, if these folks don't mind, but uh. yeah. Well, the, the thing is, he just—he's a funny guy because, like, I think in part he imagined at a competition, right? There were all these um, mm -hmm. conservatory students who work really hard, who are a little—maybe you know, they're not the greatest players, but they have great technique. And so he's asking them to do something that's going to make them uncomfortable. You'll you'll see what it is or when she does it later. It's, it's a much more physical engagement with your whole body. Um, and well, I think he was doing that as a sort of mischievous way, in a sense. In part because um, a composer, if you have a new piece, it's to explore something that they don't get to explore in all the other um, Tchaikovsky concertos and so on, right? So he wants something special. Right, and actually Gergiv, who is um, heading the competition um, that year, said when he saw the score, he said, no, you know, they c you, we can't accept this. This is impossible. So John, who's a, who's a, a great friend and a wonderful guy, but... Um, he takes things very personally, and he's, you know, somewhat, somewhat neurotic. And um, <laughs> he says that that's, that's because he's half Calabrian and half Jewish. But uh, anyway, um, he, he was all upset, and he called me. And so, I mean, I took, it took me about a week and a half, and I had to work really hard because the piece had just been finished. But um, I ended up doing a, a, a video of it as well as an audio recording because I figured Gergiev can always say, oh, you know, she edited that or put the feed in later or whatever. So I did a, an actual video for him to send to, to Moscow, um, like a nonstop, you know, there no editing or anything like that. And um, I gave it to him as a, as a, as a Christmas, Christmas present way back then. And, um, and he, was, he was incredibly happy. So that sounds great. Yeah. Fantastic. Just to prove that it was possible. It was, and yeah. indeed, you'll you'll see shortly that in, <laughs> indeed it is, um, and um, and that uses scottatura tuning, and so you have a different instrument for that too. Tell us about that instrument. Uh, yeah, I brought my my carbon fiber for that just because um, I I'm playing everything else on a Guaranini from 1779, yeah. which is not mine, but it is mine for now, thanks to an anonymous donor, and has been for 15 years. Um, the carbon fiber is well. You'll you'll hear the difference when uh, you know immediately. But but after about a minute or two, then it it actually doesn't. It sounds pretty good. It's just different. And for this kind of stuff, because John's thrown in a lot of Appalachian and a lot of you know sort of fiddly techniques and stuff, it uh, I think it actually uh, works quite well. He used uh, scordatura, which is also known as cross tuning in um, in the more traditional world. Uh, which means that the strings are tuned differently. So when I'm doing a recital like this and doing John's piece in the middle of it, I do need a different violin because I can't tune the G down to an E and expect it to stay there without coming back up. So then you lose all the harmonies that he created and stuff. So, right. so that's why it's a different fiddle. Have Have you done um, um, bluegrass or other American um, fiddle music, or if you play? Because you seem to it seems to interest you that part relationship the violin of having this broad relationship that takes takes in various different cultures and so on well, well my background is more the Canadian sort part uh, of that yeah, you know I mean yeah I have a background in Acadian because uh, my dad also Ottawa Valley step dancing Cape Breton you know this kind of stuff I know better I suppose than Appalachian and bluegrass right. uh, but they're they're quite similar in a way I mean once you delve into them then yeah they're very different but uh, I mean, the idea is is very similar. Very similar, yeah. I, th I mean, the background is all the same. You know, it's all the Scottish, Irish, and 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 folks who came over and brought their traditional music, and then as soon as people moved to different parts of the world, it changed uh, the new world. Mm -hmm. But the origins the same. And what about the technical aspects on the instrument? Approximately the same, or? Um, for you mean for Ottawa Valley? Yeah, yeah all those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, like Acadian has a lot more droning, maybe. Right. Uh, so, th so in that way, it's closer to bluegrass because bluegrass drones a lot. Um, Ottawa Valley tends to be really just kind of it. It sounds to everybody more or less just like Irish tunes, um, except happier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cape so Breton, you know, same idea, and uh, well, I mean, Nova Scotia means New Scotland anyway. So, you know, that tends to be more the Scottish side of things, and. Um, so, like the trills will be a third instead of a second, wow. and yeah, little, little, details little things like, like that. that, and and those details are, are so important, you know. And, and the the difficulty is is actually 
you know, for somebody like me to play that stuff, it's actually very easy. But to get all the details is 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 very difficult. Sure, well you must be very attuned to that, given all the folk songs too, which you're talking about an area in Europe that are all contiguous, and as you we mentioned talked about last night, share a lot of things. So then you mm -hmm. become very tuned into what the things that are different, right? Which are usually subtle details and in inflection. Yeah, well, uh, it's. You know, the the further east you go, the more melismatic it becomes, uh -huh. I suppose. And uh, for me, I, I kind of prefer modulation. I, I'm just closer to it. And so the minute you sort of cross the Bosphorus, with the exception of Ladino music in, um, in Istanbul, it becomes almost entirely melismatic. You know, like I, I think it comes from the, oh, not a cantor, what are the calls, you know, from the... Um, from the from the imam from the mosques and stuff like that y you, you know how you hear that every right. hour or something like that so that's i think the idea behind a lot of the folk stuff as well when i say melismatic it, it means that like the bass always kind of stays the same and you know you do all these things and it's about the performer and it's not exactly a tune and it, 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 it it's right, just a whole it's, uh, it's in terms of the text setting too, right? Refers to I mean right. many so you you sing many different pitches per um, syllable and right, so on so right on. right and so it's just it's I mean, I think it's very beautiful, but it's a little far away for me. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and so modulation stuff, uh, you still have, you know, uh, like for example, though, Bulgaria is a lot more melismatic than, say, Serbia or Hungary. So y as you go east, you know, it starts kind of opening but up. But then Bulgaria also has the rhythmic aspect, right, that comes from dance and the strong but right. so does macedonia yeah. so do, i mean right. you they know yeah it. and our even our greek gypsy one is in nine eight but not your general nine eight it's one two one two one two one two three one two one two right. one two one two three like this kind of thing so that um i used to think that maybe alexander the great like had a foot shorter than than the other <laughs> or something so that that's why all of the all macedonian of the stuff is because right, right. uh -huh. it's always in five or seven, seven or yeah some sort of usually two seven three that's yeah. irregular yeah, yeah. yeah. um Great, and now, amongst the other things you do, and speaking about other musics, you also have a polka band, right? Yes. Tell, tell us about that. Yes. It's called Polkestra, and our debut album was called Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and last year we did a we did a wedding album, actually, and uh, just sort of polkified all of the great standards, and then we did a whole bunch of uh, wedding tunes from around the world, like sort of world world wedding tune. So it was the idea of the perfect wedding day, you know, the processionals, recessionals, the signing of the registry, and then and then the party with the Albanian, the Irish, the Italian dances and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, Martin here and, and Matt Van Brink, whose foster tunes we're doing later on, they've done a lot of the arrangements for it because um, we're a bit of a motley crew. Yeah, wh what's, <laughs> the, what's the ensemble? What's the uh, combination? Well, there's there's me on, on, on violin, there's Daniel Lapp, who's uh, this kind of iconic musician from out in the Pacific uh, Northwest, uh, the Canadian Northwest, and he plays trumpet, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, chord piano, harmonica, and he does all the vocals, and I think I've missed a few. Uh -huh. So basically, he's our sort of all-around guy and polka expert. Um, so, But usually he's on trumpet, especially for the for the uh, classical, more classical ones. And then we have accordion, of course, because we can't have polka without yeah. accordion. And, and our bass instrument is a contrabassoon. Right, that's so a, <laughs> a normal polka standard, I take it. Well, not right. I mean, a polka no, would have a tuba, tuba. So, exactly. yeah, so we have we have instead contrabassoon, which, uh, which is uh, fun for a lot of reasons. What was it like writing for that combination? Dealing with that? Have you gotten to know it, like the ins and outs now, too, doing a number of pieces? Uh, a little bit. I've, I've done a few of them. The first one was uh, Ride, of the, Ride of the Pokeries, mm -hmm. which was uh, a Wagner, <laughs> a bunch of Wagner tunes, Tannhauser and uh, Valkyrie, of course. And um, you sort of, uh, well, we, it's, it's always kind of like who's in the room. It's sort of like when we did uh, the Ave Maria, um, you reported to me, oh, the studio has a Wurlitzer, so we're going to have a Wurlitzer in it. <laughs> and it's, and I, I, I'm convinced one day if she, there was a serpent, you know, that old right, serpent right, instrument, yeah, yeah. she goes, you're gonna, right. we're going to use a serpent because it's in the corner. Um, <laughs> so, so it's sort of, you know, Lara says, here are the people I have, here's what I want right for that. And and again, it's, it's the limitation, too. I you mean, like that, yeah, because it oh gives you it. this project. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, we, we did one called J.S. Bachelor Party, <laughs> um, which was my title, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and it was Vakadalf and, and uh, Yesu Joy of Man's Desire, which 
are two very different tunes. One's in 4-4, four, four, one's in 3-4, so you had to try and find a way. Again, I love the idea of the mashup, the putting things on top of each other, so mashing those two tunes so you could hear them at the same time was something. And also, um, uh, finding, putting cannons in there, doing, trying to make Bach proud <laughs> in, in some sort of way, <laughs> even when he's cursing at us for, why are you doing this? But, um, yeah, and, and, and then Lars become one great arranger, too. I mean, you've... Um, do you do? Do yourself, do you? Yeah, I know you, you, you uh, the Salut de Mort, you did. And uh, I think it's ready yet. And uh, yeah, so uh, we d we've done, a b we've done a several of those. And, uh, but it's great, you know, the, the contrabassoon is interested in the right four, especially if you t pair it with the bass, because we also have a bass player. Yeah, uh, sometimes. Um, and the two of them together do make a tuba esque, um, tuba -esque timbre. Uh -huh. Yeah, contrabassoon is a great sound. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, great, and now we haven't talked about the Matt Van Brink's piece. You want to tell us a little bit about um, the oh. Stephen Foster arrangement? Yeah, well, I, I mean, Matt, because I knew him from these polka arrangements, so I knew he had a very sort of uh, witty way about uh, somehow making making things fun and, uh, and interesting to listen to. And originally we had been trying to do something by Kurt Weill because both of us are big fans of Kurt Weill and think he's underrated, actually. Mm -hmm. So I thought like a little sort of a medley for violin and piano, Kurt Weill Sounds tunes. great. Yeah. yeah, well, unfortunately, the Kurt Weill estate is, um, well, mean, I guess. Yeah, uh, they, they refused. They didn't want you to do any elaboration or variation uh, on it. Yeah. There was something like that, and then and no, uh, he wasn't going to be able to have his name on it, and it was going to cost like a million dollars. And it w I mean, right. it was just, they made it impossible, actually. Exactly, right. I think that's why he's see, underrated, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which I think is a real shame because he's a, such a great songwriter. But um, anyway, so we went back to the idea of, uh, of Stephen Foster, who's obviously public domain. Right. And, um, and uh, Matt's always been a big fan of his uh, as well. So, uh, and he just wrote some of the most charming possible tunes of Americana. Mm -hmm. And um, so Matt just kind of put them together in a, in a very sweet way, and that's our, our little Foster medley. Right. And is it just sweet, or is it ironic? I wasn't quite sure. It's, well, it's very <laughs> virtuosic, as you'll hear um, in parts. It's there's some yeah, virtuosity yeah. to it, but I mean, a, a lot of it is, is really just, just, just kind of straight charm, just, like just really yeah, charming right. stuff. And uh, Martin and I have made a lot of changes to it. I mean, like Matt said last night, he, 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 he guesses about the violin a lot. <laughs> so then I, I change it and make it more violinistic. And there's some places where, because he knew it was for Martin, so he would just write... Um, do some fun stuff here in E major, and then and just write the chords. So Martin's right, actually improvising you, yeah. a lot of it. Oh, is that true? And um, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But but do you end up working it out for yourself from then on, or do you actually is it different different nights? Might it be different tonight from last night? We'll for see both if, of us, it see changes. If I notice, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's yeah. A, there's one interlude that is just like a little bit. Uh huh. Well, yeah. that, that keeps things <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Okay. Someone good. wasn't too happy with that last night. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't either of you, I take it. <laughs> no, it was Matt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, What's that doing oh well. there? <laughs> he shouldn't have left it open. You know, there, there you get That's that back right. to the thing with composers in control. It's mm -hmm. like, see, he should have told you to do everything the way he wanted. Yeah. So great. Just, um, I know you haven't heard the pieces yet, and you'd have probably more questions after. But does anybody have any questions for either of them? Um, In the second half, it's, it's the overall theme of, of the area, of the actual sort of geographical area, I suppose. Um, the first half is, I except for the Foster, uh, well, I guess the, the Corleano and the Foster are a bit linked because they're both more or less Americana. So th there, there is that which links them. The first two, um, kind of not at all. <laughs> Actually, they're completely right. different. Well, the first two are maybe different. Yeah. And the first two are, are well, I mean, Trivial Pursuits is, is quite nice. There's some jazzy elements and this and that, but, but Maralinga is, is really intense. So I kind of wanted to sort of front load the concert a little bit because it's a very unusual recital to have. Basically, we have nine pieces, seven living composers, eight of them written for me, and um, except for the Bartok. Exactly. But I'm sure he would have if he were around. I, 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 <laughs> have, I have no doubt. But maybe to to give my own answer for that too. I, th I think what's interesting in all of the pieces of the second half that she's talked about maybe in the, um, and, e and even in both the 
Coriolano and, and Matt Fink Brink's arrangement is the point of view of a composer interacting with some found material, in this case, folk music of some sort or some indigenous music, and how each of them approach it, right? Because you start finding some are much more obvious and straight with it, some it peeks through, some, some it's hard to make the connection. Um, so I think that, I, I found that a sort of an interesting thing to listen to. And I guess, you know, well, we that's why we yeah. starting the, we're yeah. starting the first half with the Bartok Second Rhapsody, which is basically all folk tunes, yeah. um, you know, strung together by, by pretty much, I mean, the master of that. Uh, he was the the, the greatest uh, researcher of his own Ex country. Oh, exactly. I mean, yeah. I, I think, um, as far as I know, I mean, I think he's considered really the first ethnomusicologist who mm -hmm. did really serious field work that still is the model. I mean, for for, for that work from you know for now for a century, um, and of course. If you know his music well, you know not only is all that stuff interesting, but as you were saying, you can see how it's infiltrated into his, his music in this, even when it's a mm -hmm. string quartet that's sort of totally separate from it, it comes up in this great way because he really knew it well and it, it's really something um, special. So I think that's great that you have Bartok because it is in a sense, for all of those pieces that come after it's sort of in, in the, or, a, or a composer in, or, in, or a piece in that sense yeah. too, um, which is really great. Anybody else? I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of love in these themes, you know, the the the, the guy and the girl, <laughs> a lot of these songs, obviously, um, a lot of kind of hope. I think people generally, when they set their stories to music, it 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 tends to be uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, thinking about the past and like just sort of uh, yeah n a lot of nostalgia especially from because uh, I, I think that um, in Eastern Europe the, the 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 gypsies and the Jewish folk were obviously influenced by the areas where they were but then the areas where they were were influenced by them who came in to that and of course everybody has been moving around since these things started for you know the past thousand years so everybody's nostalgic about something <laughs> And um, generally, gypsies and, and Jewish folk tended to be more and more nostalgic, and, and the, the people who were there tended to have, you know, the, I guess the more straighter, the more happier about love and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then, and then somehow they, they just sort of got, got mixed. I mean, there's even some tunes I have that are in these uh, incredibly weird dialects. That I've never met anybody who can translate them. You know, there's some of these... Um, Valachian dialects up in Romania and Hungary, and, and, and nobody speaks these languages anymore. So, so I'm not sure what they're about. But um, I was just gonna, yeah, because it's it's a good question because I never even thought of that aspect. These are in addition to these musical styles, they all different languages. I mean, do you tend to make sure you get a translation of them and know about them? And do the composers, like when you're writing, are you aware of the text? Does that play any role? And yeah, for the for the Serbian one, we have a we have a translation. Um, yeah, I mean it depends on on the language. It right, obviously, it sort of depends. I, I pretty yeah. much know somebody from a, a each of these countries, so um, I can usually get at least a, a good idea. But uh, I would say more than about death, these are about uh, uh, about memories actually, and 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 love. And um, uh, let me just think. Uh, well, Milica, Rumalai, that's kind of a. That's a nostalgic one, isn't it? Because it's, yeah. Yeah. 
Because I think that's really, it's more of a dance. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking glasses. Yeah, but I mean, some of this stuff, especially Romania, um, like the, the instrumental Romanian stuff, the, the stuff that's originally written for the violin or the hammer dulcimer is so fast that you don't, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's actually virtuosic music for those instruments. It's not a song. And so a lot of the ones of those I transcribed for myself. Right, that does it. But, um, and there, uh, I mean, there's a lot that are, Chardash is instrumental. For example, there was, it right. was, it was never, it never had words. So, you know, we just kind of have to guess in those right. cases, but. Um, yeah, so each sounds different in terms of approaching that, you know, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So t t tell me um, each of you what's, what's coming up for each of you both together separately. What are you, what new projects are you doing? Uh, I'm going to Toronto in a couple days uh -huh. uh, for right. another another recital with um, oh, another pianist. Oops. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> with a Canadian Armenian pianist, and um, and then we're actually going to Spain to Valencia in is it uh, January? I think uh, yeah, in January to do a bunch of, of recitals, and I think that one actually we're uh, probably going to do. We have a, a recital that I uh, a program which is. Uh, a little shorter than this one, and it's basically from from jazz to gypsy, bookended by Ravel. Mm -hmm. So we have at the beginning the Ravel sonata, which contains a blues movement, of course, yeah. and at the very end the Ravel Zigan, which is his impressionistic paraphrase on Hungarian gypsy music. And so in between, we slowly go from jazz over to gypsy stuff. So anyway, we'll be doing that there. But That's I'm going to try to add something flamenco, just you know, so they'll be happy. Uh -huh. so sounds good. And you, what do you, what project are you working on as a um, composer? I, well, I go back to Seattle tomorrow. I teach at uh, Central Washington University in Ellensburg. And um, let's see, the next thing I have after this, I'm playing my piano concerto on the 8th of December with the school orchestra there, a very good orchestra. Is uh, it, you've played it before or is it? I've never played it before. It's always been ah, that's so. so you got to work cut out in the I next know, week or two. I have two? a lot of memorizing to do because... Uh, so well I have you don't to want do to be the, the composer and forgetting your exactly. own. Exactly, and, like and the problem being a composer, sometimes you start to go down diff different avenues. You know, mm -hmm. you s sit there and say, well, I wrote that. If, if, you wrote, if you wrote five measures and threw them away, they're still somewhere in your head. Yeah. So yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a chance you will go to those five measures. Um, yeah. that and that's what I But aside from that, yeah, um, uh, some compositional projects, a trombone and percussion piece that I have to start working on very soon. That sounds great. More yeah. polka music for the two of you, or...? Anything coming up polka wise? Do you like you're on the next record already? Or? Oh well, we're, we've we've got a tour probably uh, cooking for next year, so so we'll see we'll see about that. But yeah, about the pianist composer uh, Bartok always got lost in his own stuff actually. Uh, that, well, it wasn't that a story a famous story with Brahms too? I think he had a huge slip and was at the sec I f first concerto I think actually, and then he he stopped playing in public as as much after that. I think figured it's better to let somebody else do it, yeah, it which be is my approach too. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 not. It can be a frightening moment, I'm sure. Must be way more embarrassing if you're the composer. That's that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Trying to psych him out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, anyways, well, great to talk to you both, and looking forward to hearing. Oh, the concert thanks for having us. Get it's tonight. Great thanks, to be yeah. here in Thank Princeton. You. Bye bye.